This will be a little different from the usual fair, as we'll be discussing a game that is less than a month old, so there may be some potential spoilers. If you wish to avoid hearing about even the most basic plot points before playing and or completing the game, then I'd recommend watching some of the other videos in this series. But don't worry, some of them are potentially several decades out of the spoiler zone. All that being said, this won't be as deep a dive as some of the other games I've covered. This is purely because, well, there is still a DLC content to be released, whilst I've mostly focused on story completion in getting ready for this review. I'll go into the extra content and side missions in a future episode, but don't worry, there's still a lot of stuff to go over. So welcome to Does Whatever a Spider Can, where we take a look back at the webhead's long and varied gaming career, and we find out just how much they replicate Spidey's signature powers. This is the first part of my review for Marvel's Spider-Man, released exclusively for the PlayStation 4, with part 2 dropping at some point early next year as the final DLC episode is released in December. This game is published by Sony Interactive Entertainment, and was developed by Insomniac Games, the studio most well known for creating the Spyro and Ratchet and Clank franchises. Right off the bat, this game setting seems unique in that it is possibly the first game to be based entirely on the post One More Day slash Brand New Day canon. This is mostly notable due to the inclusion of characters such as Mr. Negative, Martin Lee, and his fee center, and Yui Watanabe, an NYPD captain who is secretly assisting Spider Man. This won't be the first of the parallels to another crime fighter, but we'll get to that later. Whilst this is the current continuity in the comics, which previous games have also naturally used, this particular storyline has had some additional writing by Spidey scribe Dan Slott. Slott is one of the four writers post One More Day, and would eventually become the sole writer of Amazing Spider-Man from 2010 until this very year, only leaving after issue 801 of the comic. Some of these elements have been mentioned in other games, including the Amazing Spider-Man movie series adaptations. But this is the first time they've appeared in significant roles confirming the Brand New Day continuity. Another big plot point from Brand New Day is the controversial erasure of the Spider marriage, with Peter and MJ splitting up several months prior to this game and having not spoken to each other since. Do you remember why we broke up? This is a trick question, isn't it? Saved by the siren. In this particular setting, Peter has been Spider-Man for 8 years at this point, and the game hints at his deep history within this universe, including mentioning many of his memorable rogues gallery. However, we also learn at the start of the game that Peter is currently working for Dr. Octo Octavius as a lab technician working on advanced limb prosthetics. In another twist of fate, we find that Norman Osborne is the current mayor of New York. Mr. Osborne. Oh, please. How long have we known each other? It's Mr. Mayor. <laughs> it's Norman. Norman! Neither one of them has so far taken up their respective alter egos in this continuity, but the hints are there. Mary Jane has also been given the ultimate makeover, as she's now a daring investigative reporter. This version of NJ's backstory is more akin to her ultimate Spider-Man version. I appear to be the only reporter on the scene. I'm the only one dumb enough to be here. See what I did there? With that universe as MJ being a reporter in high school. MJ wrote this article in the school paper about student protests. She was a heck of a journalist even then. It's assumed she's been part of the Daily Bugle staff for quite some time, although it seems that the investigative part of her journalism is quite recent. Much to Peter's chagrin. <sighs> you know this is exactly why we broke up. I thought we broke up so you could focus on your career. We broke up because you wouldn't stop treating me like a baby. Don't do this, MJ. Don't do that, MJ. Oh, that's too dangerous, MJ. I may not have super spider powers, but I'm not made out of glass. You snuck into the middle of an armed military... You know what? Can we not do this right now, please? This, of course, leads to some of the tension in the relationship between the two, especially as Peter still has a complex about trying to protect MJ despite her wishes or the fact that she doesn't seem to actually need it at times. Good job. Now let's get you out of here. What about the devil's breath? I'll come back for it. No. We're partners, remember? Can we argue later? If we don't help those people, they could die. So could you. I can't let that happen. No. No, I got myself into this. I'm getting myself out. What do you mean you got yourself into this? The game itself kicks the plot into Top Gear from the start, with the tutorial stage being the final takedown arrest of Wilson Fisk. 
also known as the Kingpin. Writing your memoirs? Don't forget the hyphen between Spider and Man. It seems after several years of encounter between Spider and the Kingpin, the NYPD and the city's prosecutors finally have enough evidence to put him away for good, and Spidey is champing at the bit to take the big guy down finally. Come on, Yuri, I've been waiting eight years for this! After almost destroying Fisk's town in the chaos, Fisk vows that the city will only get worse without him, as he was apparently keeping all the crime at bay. Idiot! I'm the one who kept order in this city! One month! In one month you wish you had me back! Not long after this, MJ is digging into the secrets of Fisk's underground business dealings when she stumbles upon a secret called Devil's Breath. What is Devil's Breath? This discovery being incredibly poorly timed with a revelation of a gang wearing demon masks and having funky glowing powers and weapons. Whoa, what is up with that glowing stuff on your hand? Are you guys ghosts? The demons swiftly take over most of Fisk's former operations and quickly set themselves up as a major power player under the operation of someone called Mr. Negative. Fisk's territory is ours now. Not today. Peter naturally tasks himself with tracking down and stopping the demons. All while balancing his job at Octavius Industries, his relationship with Arme, who is also currently working as a volunteer at the Feast Homeless Shelter. I still wish you and MJ could work things out. She's a great girl. She is, but... The two of you would make some beautiful wow. baby. Uh... Peter. Attempting a reconciliation at MJ. No dumplings, I hope. You're never gonna let me live that one down, are you? Nope. <laughs> and mostly failing to keep up his payments at his apartment. The last part leads to a somewhat amusing mission where Peter must track down his missing thumb drive full of spidey technology blueprints throughout New York City's garbage. Oh, this isn't your daddy Spider-Man making web fluid from scraps of chemicals. He's had eight years to create and improve his equipment, especially with the help of Dr. Octavius' laboratory and incorporating some found tech into his arsenal. Peter, being the naturally brilliant scientist, puts his skills to good use throughout the game, with plenty of mini-games based on hacking and chemical analysis. You know, kind of like a CSI game, but more believable. One fateful night, Spidey uncovers a secret Fisk storage facility with the help of Officer Jefferson Davis just as it's about to get raided by the demons. Officer Davis, call me Jeff. And you are? Uh, <laughs> just messing with you. My son's a big fan. After Davis helps Spidey defeat the demons, Norman Oswald makes him the hero of the situation, including setting up a political rally where he intends to honor the officer for his bravery. At this point, we meet another key member of the Spider-Verse, Davis's son, Miles Morales. Hey, you got this, Dad. I mean, come on, you saved Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure that makes you an official superhero. <laughs> and everything after this point is pretty much spoilerific. Although I will say at the end of the second act, we are introduced to this universe's version of the Sinister Six as things get even worse for Spidey. The last character I should mention is former Bugle editor J. Jonah Jameson, who has gone full Alex Jones in this universe. This is Just a Facts with J. Jonah Jameson, where listeners like you discuss the issues affecting our city with Pulitzer Prize winning two time. Two time. Pulitzer Prize winning former publisher of the Daily Bugle. Hey, plug the book. And, and as always, if you order Mr. Jameson's book, Spider Man Threat or Menace, within 24 hours of our broadcast, you'll get an autographed copy at no extra charge. No personalizations? Don't ask? Not gonna get it. Jonah's rants are gloriously cringeworthy as he manipulates basically everything to fit his narrative. Admittedly, this is a brilliant update to the character, essentially giving Jonah a modern facelift more typical than an extremist pundit. Ah, the truth bomb strikes. But wait, here's a 50 megaton payload of fact. While Spider Man tried to grab the glory for himself, chasing one truck, another vehicle got away with an arsenal of deadly, illegal weapons. Fisk for all his faults, would never have let them be used in this city. But these demons, either they're some kind of fanatical cult, or they just don't care. Anybody feel like they're in danger now? Naturally, he's close to not at all evil, Mayor Osborne. Almost like they're trying to parallel something. Mayor Osborne, thanks for calling in. No, thank you, John. When you were publishing the Bugle, you were always fair to me. Tough, sure, but fair. Well, that's my job, Mr. Mayor. All I have is my integrity, and I won't compromise it for anyone. Now, what's this crucial breaking news you're revealing for the first time anywhere? 
on my show. Thank you for calling in, Mr. Mayor. My lines are open for you anytime. Jared, did you hear? Tough, but fair! That's our new slogan. I don't care who else is using it. Don't care. Speaking of character portrayals, massive praise goes out to Yuri Lorenthal, who absolutely nailed his performance of Peter and Spidey. This probably isn't that hard, he's portrayed the character several times, since first playing the character in the Spider-Man web showers and including some of the amazing Spider-Man movie tie-ins. I genuinely think this is one of the best performances of the character in a video game to this date. Now that you quit smoking, what do you tell people when you come up here? That I need a break from their crap. Fair enough. So, why'd you call? Need a date to the policeman's ball? You got a black and white suit? Uh... Obviously helped by some spectacular writing from the developers. Even better is just the sheer chemistry between Peter and MJ's Laura Bailey, making the development of their relationships throughout the game one of the biggest highlights. So, how's the grind at the Bugle? Mm. Well... Yeah, well, I just got an all-caps text from Robbie about my so-called antics tonight, so it looks like I'll be meeting with a legal team. Again. Uh, as soon as he reads the article you're gonna write, guaranteed promotion. I absolutely adore the fun banter between Spidey and Yuri Watanabe, especially the whole spider cop shtick. Now I'm seeing an assault near you. You're in luck, Yuri. Your favorite tough but lovable grizzled seen too much detective is in town. What? No, 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 no. You promised you wouldn't do that any- Spider cop. Please, no. Yuri Watanabe is played by Tara Platt who Yuri Lorenfold is married to in real life. Wait a minute. A quick shout out goes to returning Spider-Man the movie the game Vulture actor Dwight Schultz, just because the world needs more Lieutenant Barkley in it. Switching now to the gameplay itself, and it's definitely the most polished and smooth Spidey gaming experiences I've ever played. The developers clearly got their inspiration and seemingly improved basically all aspects of the previous games, especially with traversing the city being one of the purest joys of playing the game itself. It says a lot that when given the option to fast travel, and you almost always opt out because swinging around the city is just way too much fun. And now having played it through to completion, I only bothered fast traveling to get the trophy. There is still some clunkiness inherent to just the mechanics of trying to portray a character like Spider-Man, but overall it's been vastly improved over practically all the previous games. This game also includes several side missions, including collection quests, chases, and arena battles. All these are useful as they give you tokens that are used for upgrading and unlocking equipment and costumes. There are plenty of these around the city, and if you need to do some slight grinding or upgrading before a mission, there are plenty of opportunities. You don't necessarily need to do these to proceed, but unlocking extra gadgets can come in handy in a fight, especially with ever increasing numbers of attackers and obstacles as it progresses. A handy tip would be to try and upgrade your equipment as much as possible before the final boss. But that's almost become a staple in most games using systems like this now. Speaking of which, you upgrade Spidey's array of web abilities and tools throughout the game, from simple things like impact weathering to gadgets such as spider drones and web bombs. Basically, these gadgets can often give you the advantage by either distracting or disabling thugs, especially in large groups when the fighting can often get too overwhelming at times. That being said, the combat for the most part is nice and simplistic, with the challenge being ramped up throughout the game with the addition of varied thugs and equipment. These include the bigger brawlers, shield thugs and weapon thugs you need to disarm, and you need to learn to pay attention to the spider sense so you can try to avoid all the constant attacks. Keeping up your combo hits and dodging will help fill your focus bar, allowing you to access some abilities to help you in the brawls, especially some instant finishing moves. This comes in handy as some thugs take a lot of hits before going down. This is feeling familiar. This game also has its own stealth missions, and unlike Spider-Man the movie the game, these are fun, well made, and even the challenge is refreshing. You can also use your spider sense to locate and determine the status of your enemies to see if they're safe from takedown without notice. This coupled with your ability to traverse high and go through events gives you the advantage in wait a minute. In an at first, weird change of pace, some of the stealth missions actually don't let you play as Spidey, but instead as <gasps> Mary Jane. Remember when I said MJ was given the lowest lane makeover? Well, the developers took it one step further, as they gave the player control over her as she tries to uncover the conspiracy running throughout the game. 
But, you know, unlike in Batman 5 Superman, it's actually tied to the plot. These missions may seem daunting at first, but they are honestly really fun, challenging, and quickly became some of my favourite parts of the storyline. Not to mention they're a good change of pace, especially with MJ using the environment to distract enemies to allow her to progress. The game also switches this up again as you play Miles in certain sections. With the addition that you can use Miles' hacking capabilities to cause distractions to aid in his avoiding detection. As someone who likes stealth games, but often gets frustrated at terribly implemented sections in non-stealth games, these segments are actually really good at blending in with the rest of the game. Uh, no pun intended. Totally pun intended. Although it can still suffer from the annoying guard randomly turning around at random times annoyance. And at least the checkpoints don't seem too far apart that progression feels too much of a burden. Speaking of sneaking around in the dark, let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Or at least the sonar locating flying rodent. For anyone who's played the Batman Arkham series before maybe getting a little bit of deja vu when playing this game. There are many elements that just feel like they've been copied directly. Namely the use of detector mode and its unseen takedown system. Let's not forget that many of these elements were already in games that predate the Arkham series, including previous Spider-Man games. But it's hard not to see the influences in this game's stealth mode. If anything, I'll be controversial and say it makes more sense in Spidey's case to his powers and character style. Not to mention that the combat itself isn't just restricted to a small room with many, 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 many thugs. It's the one thing that gets fixed from the Arkham games. The combat doesn't feel like an endurance test where if you screw up just once, you have to restart due to losing way too much health in a short amount of time. Hell, the fact that you can actually disengage from combat and move to a more advantageous position makes combat flow way better than the Arkham games. This is especially true in tense situations where enemies are just coming at you from literally everywhere and you need to figure out how to deal with them. However, the game that this one feels most like a spiritual successor to is Spider-Man 2 The Movie The Game. Even including an easter egg in the in-game Twitter feed to one of the specific random missions in that game. Try to hang on to it. What do we say? I'll never let my balloony go again. Marvel's Spider-Man feels like an absolute upgrade to the game in practically all aspects. But the sense of fun from the original remains completely intact. Plus now you can have Spider-Man hit the water without immediately warping back to land and making a piffy comment. Hey, nothing better than a soaking wet costume. One nifty feature is that you can use your banked focus to heal yourself during combat. A feature that saved your bacon more times than you can possibly imagine. With all this praising practically out of the way, let's talk about some of the problems with it. First off, the bugs. Guaranteed it's not a broken game, it's just far from perfect bug wise. And is it ironic that a Spider-Man game is full of bugs? Come on. There are still some glitches that happen in the game, especially in enemy spawning, and I've had the game crash on me whilst I was in a menu. The worst one for me, and it almost ruined the game purely because of the placement, was during the opening tutorial level as you raid Fisk Tower. To teach you the combat mechanics, you beat up a bunch of Fisk security. But after defeating them, the next batch spawned but didn't enter the floor like they were supposed to. It was confusing as it still felt like I was supposed to do something, but with no indicators of where I was supposed to go, it got disappointing quickly. That was until I realized that I could hear thugs behind a wall. and realize the need to reload from the checkpoint. This was not a good place for a glitch like this, as it was one of the earliest impressions of the game, especially seeing it was the first combat experience within it. Thankfully such things didn't happen again during the story missions, but I have had the enemy spawn or get moved behind a wall and has actually stopped side mission progress. Sadly the one thing that this is still an issue in most of these games is that you occasionally lose control over the camera as it swings around in weird places. This can get deadly in combat situations, especially as I've had the camera move out of the world and you desperately try to survive while being unable to see anything. For a little fun, let's take a look at some of the weirder glitches.
Finally, the thing I can't forgive too easy is one of my least favourite gameplay mechanics, quick time events. This can be a problem as sometimes the prompts itself can be a little vague or just a little disconnected. In one cutscene you're given an L2 and an R2 prompt to shoot a load of web during a QDE, but no good or at least no quickly decipherable indication that you're supposed to tap it multiple times. This is confusing because throughout the game, you'd use these triggers for completely different actions. Especially as, at this point, you've been using R1 specifically for shooting webs. Being prompting to use not one, but two different buttons for the same action after several hours into play is honestly just a bad idea. Whilst this makes sense kinesiologically, as in you want to make the player feel like they're pulling the literal triggers to shoot the literal webs, it just feels counter to literally every other action you've done at this point. If this was a more consistent action, it could be forgivable, especially earlier on in the game to condition the player to use this during QTEs. But this actually broke my immersion, which one would shoot is the actual point of them. Speaking of kinesiology, this game relies on heavy use of the R2 button for traversal, from everything from wet springing to Peter Parkour to just simply moving quickly. There have been some modern variants of the game where you need to use two trigger buttons to simulate the more natural web swinging experience via the independent web shooters. I've always felt this makes things just too difficult in maneuvering Spidey through such a complicated environment as the renditions of New York. So I'm glad to see a return to a simpler swinging mechanic. As already mentioned, web swinging is fun and keeping the mechanics simple and allowing the system to deal with the logistics behind it makes it feel right despite not being technically correct. All this being said, the game does give you the option of simplifying the gaming experience with both the web swinging and the QT experience. As much as I will complain about them, I will play it straight to gain the proper gaming experience, especially to review the game in the context the developers wish to present it. It's also nice to know that some features do exist for those like me that might have trouble with such things, as we can experience the game without the one hurdle that stumbles us. It can be argued this potentially weakens the gameplay, but there is still more than enough fun things to do, and honestly QTEs are often a cheap way to add difficulty to a game. The only real potential flaw is just how grindy the crime system feels, especially if you try to 100% the game. It suffers from the same problem as Spider-Man 2 the movie the game, in that it randomly spawns crimes for you to solve, but there's no real apparent trigger or timed event, so it sometimes gets frustrating trying to find such things. This gets compounded by the fact that each district can have potentially four types of gangs, and each completion requires taking them down five times. This can get pretty repetitive, as it's also many of the same types of activities you do in both the storyline and in some of the challenges too. The only real consequence for failure is having to find another spawn crime just to finish ticking that box. Basically, if you're going to go for the completionist route, don't be afraid to detour from a static mission to take on a crime. The mission will always be there for you to finish later, and it takes some of the grind out. Thankfully, there is nothing involving having to stop a particular crime before you can move on. This was an issue in some of the previous games, and in fact you can practically ignore most of the stuff throughout just to focus on the story. There are times in the game when even after a mission you don't have a particular objective to follow, so these are the times you need to do a non-story event just to kick the plot along. Again, it's nothing specific, so it's player's choice. Overall, this game feels like someone has taken almost every single piece of Spidey history and distilled it into one pure experience. Almost like it's the ultimate Spider-Man! <laughs> The game borrows heavily from the comics, and the world is jam-packed with references ranging from dialogue and visual easter eggs, especially the backpack collectibles. Oh yeah, that blind guy gave me his card in case Spider-Man ever needs a lawyer. Wait, hold on. If he's blind, how did he know I was Spider-Man? There are several unlockable costumes, including many iconic and not-so-iconic costumes from comic books and the recent Marvel Cinematic Universe. This reminds me of the original Spider-Man game from 2000, the first third-person Spider game that basically inspired every game since. Sadly, no game has included the What If mode. Shame, really, as it makes replaying it really fun. All that being said, it is apparent that one of the strongest influences on the game, especially in tone and visual elements, is the Sam Raimi trilogy. For the fan of Mark Webb's films, uh, they gave him sneakers, I guess. Okay, there are a couple of the amazing Spider-Man visual elements in the costume, but really it just leaves more to Raimi in most aspects. 
The score is very reminiscent of some of the themes of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The composer John Passano, having even worked on Marvel's Netflix properties Daredevil and Defenders. One of the funniest features of the game is the photo mode, which typically in game is just used to take photos of landmarks for tokens, but in a fun twist you can use it to take selfies and add filters, frames, and even adjust Spidey's features in the photo. This is fun because the city is full of easter eggs and just some really cool features like graffiti and real world landmarks. So with all that taken into consideration, can you do whatever a spider can? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Apart from the trademark swinging, you definitely have the strength, agility, and the wide use of the spider sense. The various gadgets and versions of your web shooter technology is a bonus, and the limited use of each without a web fluid meter to worry about is a great improvement, especially as you can earn your gadget refills during combat. The suits themselves come with a special function, but as this just becomes an unlock, you don't have to wear the specific suit to use its abilities. It's also nice for, for the most part, not impeded early by having basically full access to Spidey's trademark powers. A staple that can be annoying in other superhero games. The only thing I can't think of that Spidey can't do is use the Spidey signal. Cool idea, but any light source that made it bright enough was also way too hot. Someday though. But I bet most people forgot all about that. Overall, the game feels like the most definitive version of the character, or at the very least away from the primary source material. The character feels distilled in all the right ways. His moves, his banter, his power levels, almost all just seem perfect for the character. Spider-Man in this game doesn't feel overly powerful. In fact, most enemies need more than a little tap to take them out. And the use of all his abilities throughout just feel incredibly natural and just make you want to keep playing. I'll admit I had an extra incentive to complete this game quicker than usual, but honestly, I just wanted to keep playing even after sometimes feeling completely exhausted afterwards. It's that compelling. So stick around for part two as it comes out, and we'll talk about that.